Yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, so the, um, as, as Robert said, he came up with a good title. Uh, I think one of the, the slightly better titles that came up with for this talk was by Sigrid, where she put into the program Coming Soon. And so after a number of conversations yesterday, we uh, completely rewrote this talk to uh, all be about coming soon. Um, part of the driver for that was that um, I give a talk at uh, JWC. But that's great, because he's entitled to his opinion in the same way that I'm entitled to my opinion. Um, and so, what, sorry? <laughs> well, I'm entitled to mine, that's it. <laughs> um, and what we're gonna talk about just really briefly is nine quick points of things that I see that's going to change around the web, what's gonna be coming soon in the next five to 10 years for the web, uh, if not it's a little bit sooner. And then we'll do a little bit of questions afterwards if you guys happen to think I'm wrong in any way. I will get someone to stand up here and um, pretend to be Sean Spicer. So I think the first big thing that's coming soon that has completely and utterly thrown me off is that the best kilt at Jane and Beyond is no longer on a Scotsman. <laughs> so what a weird little world we live in right now, Frank. <laughs> exactly. This is my first bit. In uh, 2012, Rangers Football Club died. In 2017, the, uh, the Undertaker retired. There's no more Undertaker. In my opinion, by 2022, typed search will be an absolute thing of the past. Right now, search is obviously huge. It's how we are able to discover new web pages. But the next one billion people that come onto the web are going to be mostly based in Africa. Uh, India, Pakistan, that sort of, what we currently consider to be emerging third world countries. The UI set up by Google for their future phones is not going to contain lots of apps. It's not going to send you into the web browser in order to go on Google pages for you to see it. You're simply going to be pressing a button or saying out loud, okay Google, and then search for this. The rise of vocal search, the rise of specific search is already happening. We're seeing it less and less in the Western world because we are, are having to overcome 10 years of behavior. But in the Eastern world, in emerging markets, vocal search is already growing rapidly. I think that if you're currently reliant and your current plan is around type specific search and keywords rather than question, I think you're going to find that your ranking in search engines and your discovery of your content is going to plummet in the next five years. Menus on mobile web pages are going to move to the bottom. This is kind of an easy one for me to predict. <laughs> Simply for the fact of most web apps and most mobile apps have actually already got their menus at the bottom of the page. I'm sure many of you have seen um, the, uh, the little UX thumb diagram that says if you hold your phone at the bottom, this is where the menu should be. A lot of mobile apps moved to the tabbing system two, three years ago. Facebook actually moved to it four years ago now. Thankfully, we as people who are able to build websites really quickly, we as people who are able to respond to user needs really quickly, we decided to ignore that animation and still make someone press a hamburger menu at the top. That's going to change really, really quickly. And the way it's going to change is that one of the big websites, your Googles, your Facebook, your Amazons, is going to move their website menu to the bottom as well. And we're going to go, ah, oh, maybe we shouldn't just do things the way we've done it for the last 15 years. I think that's going to change really, really soon. The next one, we will stop making a myriad of different 
types of web pages, we will have this little realization that there are only three types of web pages. Indexes, i.e. pages that take us to other pages. Information-based pages, pages that will have single-based articles. And then interactive pages, pages that require JavaScript, that require clicking, that require some form of animation. Right now, when we build websites, when we build web pages, we still think of trying to fit all of these things onto one page, rather than realizing that having single definition pages that have a single purpose, we can funnel people to the information or the, the value add interaction from our website very, very easily. Once we move back to the vocal searching, moving away from the idea of mouses and keyboards, I will move into that in a much easier format where people will only be coming to our websites to do a single thing. The idea of browsing and discovery is going to go away. No one likes to hear this, but I think in the next five years, what's going to come soon is that we will stop pretending we give a shit about accessibility. And it's terrible, it really is. But um, how many people here have a website that is absolutely reliant on JavaScript or it will not load? Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's grand. It happens, right? Yep, yep. The Google uh, um, website does it. Even though your current Google page literally had that Marissa Meyer built on uh, day four of her being at Google, which literally has a box and a little button, well, and it has the I'm feeling lucky button. Google produced a version of it three weeks ago that will not load if you do not have JavaScript on. It doesn't need JavaScript. They've just added a new wall. And that wall is to try and get us moving forward in the JavaScript world because it does make life easier, not just for our large companies, but for web development on the whole. But I, I also think that we, not just here in the open source community, but we in the web development community have said great things and positive things about accessibility for years. And actually, we haven't really done it. I know that if, when I build my own websites, looking back on the code and running it through the accessibility filters, mine fail in so many places. The W3C's accessibility guidelines are nonsense for the most part. And that's because they're trying to please everyone. And I think in the next five years, we will streamline the position to have web pages into one of three categories, and we will get rid of the idea that, honestly, we have done anything to move accessibility on the web forward. The next little contentious point for you guys. I don't think content management systems, as we know it, will be here in five years. I know, I know, popular. I do think, though, that they will morph into something else. I think that the mindset will change, and the point of these current systems in the future will be fully about data delivery. Now, that's not just a semantic change. Right now, we spend an awful lot of the time making sure that the UI of our CMS works well, that it works well on mobile, that, um, that um, it's iconography is great. How can we edit certain bits and not other bits? But I think the reality is when we move away from caring about the editing part of it and more about what sort of data does it deliver, does it deliver in HTML? Is there a JSON feed? Is there some form of XML feed? Does the, the content we match out automatically output the right schema.org content? based on where the data is being delivered. These are going to be the really, really important parts of what currently is a content management system in the next five years. There is a reason, ladies and gentlemen, that when the Google AMP project set up for how it was getting the data from your server, it not only required schema.org data, but it actually required to go against the schema.org spec and have that data pulled out into JavaScript format, JSON format, in the head. Because data delivery is what is important for the future. It's what's important for the browser. It's what's important for context. The content management system, it's the unimportant part. 
the purpose of websites will change. Now, in theory, the purpose of the website, the reason we go and find information, is because we have a question that we want to answer. But the purpose of a website will change to specifically answer a question. And here is my personal example about this and something that I'm working on just now. <coughs> my mom gets up in the morning and the first thing she does is she goes onto her phone and she checks what the weather is and what the weather is going to be. And I saw this was a very strange thing. I said, but is it, what is it? Because my mom likes to get me to Google things for her. I don't know if your mom does the same. But what she said to me was, will you find out what the weather is for me? And I found out what the weather is, and then I told her it. I said, is, is that the information that you wanted? She says, no, I just want to know what sort of coat to wear. The way we have built the web, the way we techies have thought, the way we have stored information, the way we have categorized information over the years, the way we display information and data to people, we have made our fellow humans jump through multiple hoops in order to get the information they want. We have set up the web to be an information-based system that does not answer the questions people are asking in their head. What I'm currently working on is an Alexa skill, because I think that's going to be the future. And you get up in the morning and you won't say, Alexa, what's the weather like today? You will say, Alexa, will I need my coat today? Alexa, what skirt will I wear today? Will it be a long one, a short one? The future is not just going to be about the weather. The future is going to be about taking lots of information. What I want is my Alexa skill, or one of you, if you build it before me, because I'm here going to be talking and drinking tonight. The purpose of answering questions is going to be different. The Alexa skill is going to say, you should wear a long skirt, but the thin one, that blue one you bought from Amazon last week because it's really nice. I know you'll want to wear the green one, but Sally asked me that question half an hour ago, and she's wearing green, so you don't want to wear the same. <laughs> that, that, it, that is scary to a lot of people, right? But the reality is, that's the question my mom is really asking when she goes on to Google and says, what's the weather going to be like? She doesn't care what the weather's going to be like. She cares what she's going to be wearing that day, or does she need to take an umbrella? They're the real questions it's going to be. And going back a little bit to the data delivery, the ability to pull content together, the moving towards this asked search rather than typed search, how we think about the web, the, the essence of the web itself is going to be massively different in five years. And if you build web pages to answer questions, not just deliver content, man, that's going to be the future. I believe that long-term support will crush existing systems. Now, the example I'm going to give of this is going to maybe upset some other people in the open source world. Uh, that's not what I mean by this, but I think it's a great example. I think Drupal 8 is fantastic. I really, really do. And that's not one of these things where you say it and then you can then attack people after. Uh, I think Drupal 8 is, is really fantastic. And I think Drupal 8 is going to grow over its next three versions till it hit 8.6, when they're aiming to have their next version 9. I think the way they have structured their six-month re release process is brilliant, and that's going to continue on to nine. And I do believe that Drupal is going to go from strength to strength. And I believe that Drupal 8 will absolutely bring it right back down. Because as we stick with this idea of version numbers, as we stick with the idea of long-term support, we have made a situation where Drupal 8 is a great example by the way, and there will be a Joomla example, there'll be a Microsoft example in the future at some stage. But Drupal 8 is having to support PHP 5 for four years after PHP 5 has lost all long-term support. It has to support MySQL for seven years after my, the MySQL version it supports loses all long-term support. And it has to support 
Symphony 2 for eight years after <laughs> Symphony 2 loses long-term support, which seems mental when we say it out loud. But Symphony released an additional version of uh, the Symphony 2, 2.10, in order to give Drupal an extra six months in order uh, for releasing Drupal 8. And as a result, all the long-term support agreed dependencies that come along with that will eventually crush what is currently Drupal 8. I think what we will find very soon, I say in the next five years, but I really think in the next two, that version numbers and semantic versioning on the whole will be removed from these large systems. The CMSs are data delivery systems, and we will move to effectively current and current minus one. And long-term support will be a thing of the past. I also believe, as much as I don't like it, and I don't, and I, I think it goes against how we built and structured the web. I think it goes against how we think. But I think the positives of doing this will massively change how websites are built. I believe that in the next five years, all CSS and HTML will be written inside JavaScript components. If you have not looked at React, if you have not looked at the thinking behind that, I strongly, strongly suggest you do. For those that don't know, everything in React is built as a single web-based component. All your styling for that component is written basically as a JavaScript JSON array. We don't have to worry about IDs. We don't have to worry about placement on the page. We don't have to worry about class names. We don't have to worry about semantic class names. Although, thanks to Bootstrap 4, we no longer worry about semantic class names. Because, by the way, if you, um, the Bootstrap 4, for those that don't know, changed the naming convention for all their colors to be specific to what the default color was. So if you now want to change the red button to blue, you actually have to still call it button red, it will just output blue. It ha you're, that's right, it hasn't been accepted. That's very true. Yeah, but the, you know, the reality is three very smart people sat there and went, this is what we're going to do now because there's nothing better than having button dash red equals green. <laughs> and, and when very, very smart people have a tendency to do that, that's when I think the game is over. <laughs> um, oh, and it says Javda script. Fuck. Oh, well, oh. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the advantage of doing this, the advantage of having component based UI, is going to win for two reasons. One, we don't actually share UI components, we share style sheets. We share JavaScript libraries that do fun things for us. We share your, the jQueries of this world, the mutuals of this world, helped create a, a new boom in web development because we were able to have effectively shared ideas and shared ways of doing things. But what we didn't actually share was the accordion, the login, the pop-up, the modal. <laughs> By moving our CSS and our HTML to inside components, inside JavaScript, by allowing that JavaScript to actually just read our data and produce websites in the same way, to homogenize, to make those websites easier for people to move and understand one website to another, to understand that login on one page is going to look the same in multiple pages. The ability to knock up websites, really genuinely working websites, incredibly quickly by having shared components, much in the same way we do now, with NPM, Package Manager, and the Node.js system, this is where I believe HTML and CSS is going to be in the next five years. It's the reason that NPM has beat Bower to almost everything, and its ability to understand dependency management across multiple trees. I believe the UI will die. Here's the funny thing. 
I think it's already dead. I think the death of it has happened. I think the thousand cuts have been placed and we've just not noticed it yet. I think Alexa, Cortana, OK Google, Siri, or I think they've already killed the UI in the same way that Uber killed taxis, in the same way that Amazon killed Walmart, and we've just not seen the growth spike in it yet. Because here's, here's the big thing, and I say this, and, and I know there's a lot of people that, that deal with UI and theming, and I'm, I'm going to say something good for you guys in a little sec, because I'm worried I might have just freaked you the fuck out. <laughs> but my thing is this. Hands up here who five years ago, ten years ago, had a browser on their phone. Ten years ago, who had a browser on their phone? Okay, that's kind of cool. That's good. That's all right. That's a lot of people. So the iPhone came out 10 years and nine months ago, and that's cool. So like, we are on the cutting edge. The iPhone came out, smart browser phones came out, and we had a browser on the phone already. That's not the same for out there, okay? So say about 50% people had it 10 years ago. Five years ago, who had a browser on their phone? <laughs> yeah, almost everyone, right? Now, who has a browser on their phone? 100%. Okay, so we went 50%, 90%, 100% in the last 10 years, that's cool. 10 years ago, who had an assistant on their phone that they could talk to? Peter. Peter phoned his wife. <laughs> you see, you know, this is the same thing. My mom would have the same answer because all she does is phone me and ask me to Google things, which is good. So five years ago, other than Peter's wife, um, who had uh, an, uh, an assistant that could ask things to their phone and it would do them? Yeah, a bit more. We, we had a bit more. That's right. Let's say 10%, 20% there. I'm okay with that. Who has one on their phone now? Okay. In, that number has changed massively in the last year. Because in the last year, Apple put Siri on every Mac. It's not just the phone. Microsoft put Cortana on every Xbox. It put it on every Windows 10 PC. It tried to put it on every Windows phone, but it couldn't find the other two of them. <laughs> the idea is not just that it, we're going to the stage of asking for things. It's, not, it's, it's the mindset shift that comes with it. The idea that we're going to sit and spend time creating this wonderful UI for our web pages and where to place our banner ads and where to get conversion and will something be above the fold or below the fold. It doesn't matter when there is no fold. The UI in terms of how we currently think about the web is already dead. We just don't know it yet. But here's the opportunity for that. Gary Vee talks a lot about this and I don't know if, if you guys have ever seen him talk, but Whenever there's a problem, whenever something is going to die, like the Seth Godin talked about the death of CDs, there's a huge opportunity there. Because if you are a themer, if you are focused on creating beautiful websites, if you are a designer, and you hear that the UI is going to die, you worry what you're going to do, I think it's going to go the opposite way for you guys. If you're passionate and energetic about it, if you want to create an accessible website that looks good, and where people want to come and read your content and the answers to your questions on your website rather than using Pocket or using a reader that already strips your content, then I think there's a huge opportunity for you guys to do that there in your right data delivery system, what we used to call content management system. So I'm not saying that the UI is going to die completely. I'm just saying that for most people it's going to die and that gives you guys the opportunity to stand out. But in order to do that, we need to change the mindset of how we think about the web, from producing content to answering questions, from content management to data delivery, from understanding that it's not just one source, it's pulling lots of sources of information together to deliver value to our users and customers. All right, guys.
Those are my 10 contentious thoughts of what's going to come soon on the web in the next five years. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, this is awesome. We have three. All right, I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to go Derek, Nick, Peter. Derek? So, a, a few questions, actually. Oh, um, be greedy, man. Yeah, yeah. The first, the first one is uh, regarding the, um, uh, the AI and stuff like that, and the changes that we need to see how we can circle the entire what should I wear today. First of all, you want Skynet because that's how, that's how you get Skynet. Yes, we do. But here's the thing. You know, there, uh, there, is, there is a thing, uh, there's a difference between uh, linear thinking and structural thinking, right? Linear thinking is just uh, uh, a simple recreation of knowledge. For structural thinking, you get the topic, you build the structure around it with different topics around it. So don't you think that if we evolve into that, into what you said, into you're not going to have what to wear about it, what should I wear, don't you think that would be actually Oh, man, it's a fantastic question. It, so, the first one, the Skynet one. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. So, Derek's first question was, um, <laughs> in terms of search that's able to know about your history, that's able to know about your life, um, do we want Skynet? The answer is, we probably don't, but the average person on the street really does. Um, as much, and here's, here's the, the, the reason we know that. The idea of selling our data, the idea of privacy, the idea of personalized ads, all the rest of it, every time some, I explain that to someone, they absolutely hate it. They're like, that seems like really scary, really intrusive. Ooh, Facebook knows I really like that. There's a reason Facebook ads really work. And it's because people actually like to be shown the Star Wars cookie cutter rather than generic advert X or Y. The, the people like the idea of search knowing exactly what they're after, as in what they like. They like personalized search. It's, it's kind of scary, actually, how easily led we are down the line with the smallest little bit of endorphins that says, oh, this actually works for me. It's the reason that Microsoft bought LinkedIn for 26 billion. Uh, LinkedIn is a horrible, useless website. And uh, no, no, it, it really is, and it should be a lot more, and it's not going to get any better. The reality is that Microsoft turned around and went, who has more data on our structure for advertising than um, Facebook? Facebook know and own our personal life way more than they, they should, and Google never should have let it happen. LinkedIn know everything about our work life, and all those weird connections that Facebook never do. They bought it for the ability to advertise directly to the um, PA of the CIO of that company. If you want to advertise directly to that person, we'll do that for $100,000 for four impressions. Because that's what we want to do. We, we, we talk a lot about privacy and stuff and, and, and the Skynet joke, but we're very cool with like throwing it out the window when it helps us. So, I kind of do and I kind of don't. I think we have to realize that for a, a lot of people, they're completely okay with that. And we're, we're making, the, what you're asking is a moral question and it's very hard to make moral judgments for everyone out there. I, th I think that's the big thing. But I think the value to a lot of people massively outweighs it. Or, or, the, or people just don't care is the reality is, you know? There was, uh, there was a really bad joke once where, um, do you know what? I will tell you that offline because we're going to go down the resort. <laughs> I, I realized that. That's great. Right, give me a sec. Nicholas, you had a question.
Yes. Yes. So, so, so um, for, for the, the folks at home, uh, Nicholas's question was, um, if we move to vocal search uh, as the primary search method, will it create a digital divide between English speakers as first class citizens versus non-English speakers as second class citizens? And the answer is, in the short term, yes, it will. One of the great characteristics about language and communication is we, humans, have only been doing it 5,000 years, right? We spent the first however many million years just like bumping around and drawing on walls and all the rest of it. The, the, the reality is that communication is new for us. Communication across borders is new for us. It's in the last thousand years. We've taken amazing leaps forward anytime there is a new way of communicating. And, and the, each new way of communicating as humans is, has d defined that era. It defines how quickly we are able to not just evolve, but how able we are uh, able to innovate. The, the thing that has always slowed down progress is the speed of our communication and how easy it is to understand. The thing that slowed down things through from, you know, a, a thousand until like 1900 BC was at uh, 80, was the fact that the fastest way of getting a message somewhere was carrier pigeon or on a horse. As soon as we were able to put up telephone poles, holy crap! Suddenly things got a lot easier, and we got a whole bunch of new innovations because the way we were able to communicate was able to change. Once we got mail and we were able to send letters to people across um, boats and planes and all it was it changed how quickly we were able to collaborate then of course we put a man on the moon and we said that's very expensive let's not do cool things like that anymore and we stopped innovating and instead we decided to focus here we, we built the internet and look at the innovations it's got just now so i think in the short term we will absolutely have find a dual class where you'll have first-class citizens that can speak English, and I think that will effectively change to be basic in the future, by the way. And I think you'll find there'll be second-class citizens that don't speak English. Uh, but I think that will change really, really quickly. Because right now, I think they just want to get that right. And once they have a blueprint for going, oh, okay, so this is how na natural language processing should work? Cool, all right, let's, let's cheat. Let's start going through the Latin-based languages. Let's go for Spanish, because that's next. Let's then go for French and German. And then we'll get, they'll get to Greek and multiple others. I think there'll be a huge struggle for it when it comes to the African-based languages. But I think you'll find in the next 10 years that it'll not be there. Cool. Peter, you had a question, and Frank? So that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, again, for the folks at home, um, Peter was asking about um, if, if you move away from uh, long-term support, how do you keep innovating by allowing people to break backward compatibility? Did I sum up okay? Real. I think what you'll find is that the idea of long-term support as we currently see it is being driven by a mindset for a, a people, a generation, who are used to the phrase, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that was absolutely true for our first two million years. 
It, it, it really was on, on, on this planet. And as we moved into the idea of wars and communication and all the rest of it, yes, things changed on a day-to-day -day basis, but on the whole, nothing really changed. Nothing changed from you know, 1000 AD to 1600 AD. We paid, just paid tax to someone slightly different based on who had invaded our country at any given point in time. That isn't true anymore. And even from 1900 until 1950, the more things changed, the more they stayed the same. Yeah, they, they did. Communication didn't change. As we moved into the software era, we, we had this change of mindset that hasn't quite perforated through. My mom gets crazy upset when Microsoft releases an update to Office. Crazy, like, like as, as if it's a personal slap in the face. My mom says, but I bought that. Why is it changing? The idea that it's newer, secure, or it's better for her, that, that doesn't compute. Because she says, yeah, but I bought my car and it doesn't change into a new car. I bought my typewriter and it still works. I actually did that, which is a very poor joke for my mum. My mum once complained about Microsoft Office when they put the ribbon thing, which is fucking stupid, right? But they put the ribbon thing along the top for Office 2007, and she went, can you not just get me something that will stay the same? So I bought her a typewriter. <laughs> can you not? Bought her a typewriter. Um, and as much as I get to tell that joke very rarely now, um, but that is what a certain generation of people want on a certain mindset of people want. They want the idea that they've bought something and they know it will last them a while. They don't want the change in it. And that is because while software was in its infancy, while we were creating loads of new stuff, we built stuff that broke all the time. We didn't have great testing procedures a lot of the time. We were okay with bugs going and stuff, or we weren't okay with bugs going and stuff, but there was a very big man that had paid the money that said, you will release it. And we're currently seeing that, by the way, and I know this, this is skipping around the question, I'll come back to it. We're seeing that same product, and as a result, that same lack of confidence in the market in the games industry. I don't know how many of you guys are gamers, but uh, whenever they say, this is what we're going to build the game from, they actually release the game and the DVD on a date pick three years in advance. And the first thing you've got to do is download all the patches for all the things that they never got around to fixing or never pretended they were going to get done by the release date. We have, as an industry, not just us, but the entire software industry, has spent the last 20 years releasing things when the man says the release date is and not when it's actually done. We've also spent a lot of time previously of spending two years doing waterfall Gantt charts and going, this is all the stuff we're going to build. We only have four days to fucking build it. <laughs> so we, we, out there, those guys have no faith in us. And it's not just enterprise people that are holding on, you know, like BA, holding on for dear life onto anything that will keep their planes in the air. It's actually the fact that the enterprises, right down to the mums and dads and, and anyone who has lived through the software crisis, it has no faith in us to deliver, if we're totally honest. And we've seen it. How many times have you guys Googled something and got a completely weird result? How many times have you went to a website that was working yesterday but doesn't work today? But actually, it turns out it does work, but only you know, 97 out of the 98 JavaScript libraries actually fucking load it. No one out there has faith in us because we haven't given them reason to have faith in us yet because we keep changing our mind on what we're building. And as a result, we've had to create this weird trade-off structure for long-term support where we turn around to people and go, guys, we're actually pretty good at this. And to prove it, we will create long-term support packages for you guys so you can sit there and build up trust while we go off and do all this cool shit that we really wanted to do anyway. Now, we need to do the cool shit to innovate, right? Because otherwise, we're never going back to the fucking moon. But the reality is we also need to build trust from everyone out there that we're not going to break everything just because we saw something new and cool. That's my thoughts, Pete. That's right. Frank, your question?
great question. It's a great, in fact, I think it's, I think it's a couple of questions. So, the, for everyone at home, the question from Frank was, um, as we move to single returned result, does that leave an opening for whatever format, there are, whatever provider is giving you the result to manipulate that in some form, be it um, a slightly different answer, be it phrasing, be it advertising, be it censorship, or even things we've not spoken of. And the answer to that is uh, yes, it's already here, it's already happening, it's called the Google homepage. Uh, we lost that battle 10 years ago. Uh, and that sounds really sarcastic, but it's not, but it, it, it's absolutely spot on. And uh, I, I can help prove it. And um, if you, by the way, go to Google just now and you type anything in, the first result is an advert. Um, and over the last 10 years, they've done a better job of making that tiny little box that says advert slightly bigger. Um, so that you can see it and you know it's an advert. But here's the thing, but if you go to Google now, the first thing is a, uh, a piece of information that Google has pulled out that it believes is the answer to your question. It might not actually be the first ranking answer, by the way, but that's okay. And then it comes down to their AMP pages. Okay, now their AMP pages are great because what AMP does for Google, and there's a reason this falls back to your question, is it takes content from other websites and pulls it all together, doesn't really tell you where the content is from, doesn't qualify whether the content is right or not, and promotes it to you in the Google search. So an example I had with a client the other day is that when they searched for their content, because basically one of their executives was in the news, there was a Guardian article right next to an article from um, a very right-wing American news thing. And at no point in time did Google differentiate between the two? And in fairness, that's not Google's um, output. But right now that's okay because on a web-based search, you are able to see hundreds of answers. As you, we move to the situation where we're only being given one answer, our, everyone's out there ability to make decisions on how accurate that is goes away. It's a, it's a, it's a very scary thing. It is. But the reality is that most people, when searching for something, are searching for a very specific answer. They are not searching to be given information in a library to understand the bias. That's it. But it, it is. It's it. The other thing we've also got to realize is that um, I'm less worried about it from an advertising marketing point of view because advertising and marketing as we currently know it is also dead right it's not really dead yet because they're still pumping stuff out you know there's still the the great 17 million geico adverts on tv before dancing with the stars right but that's them holding on to like dead dying industry in the same way walmart are and the same way woolworths did right into the point when it closed that that industry is dying but what's replacing it influencers you know? Our kids today are not getting their news and their how to do makeup from their mom and dad. They're getting it from that kid on YouTube and Instagram that's showing them how to look like drag queens. That, that, ship, is, that ship is already sailed, right? Like the influencers are on the rise, and they have been for five years. Just Geico didn't notice it for, for five. That's why they're all doubling down on TV ads, because they, they, it's getting niche and niche, but they're owning more of it. But when it dies, it dies hard. So the reality is we're going to get new ways of marketing because people aren't going to go to Google and say, okay, Google, show me this. They're going to go to YouTube or they're going to go to that influencer page and say, all right, what's the best makeup am I going to buy? What Mac should I get? It's, it's, it's. Well, so, yes and no, I think promotion is very different because I think there's a difference between promoted as we see it in terms of being on the Google page and, well, let's talk about this. The most famous person in the world is famous because she let her husband's brother at the time pee on her 
on a sex tape. Her mum sold it to her mum's uh, old intern, who was called Ryan Seacrest, and he created a TV show called, with the sex tape star in it, called Keeping Up With The Kardashians. And she left her job, her, her job before Keeping Up The Kardashians was um, taking Paris Hilton's clothes and putting them into the right carousel. So Kim's job, Kim Kardashian's job, one of the most famous people in the world, uh, was to be peed on and to put par Paris Hilton's clothes uh, in the right order for the Paris Hilton show. And within a year, she has her own TV show, her whole family's a TV show, and they're back in the fortune. Promotion and marketing never really involved Google. So there's nothing we're gonna, ever going to do about that. And I, I'm going to take just one more. All right. Super dangerous. Because it's basically putting your brand on Google and presents as a Google mm -hmm. And in our time where we have a lot of fake news, you can basically inject the uh, content of fake news into Google and you could have nothing you could realize. Completely. So um, uh, Radix's point uh, was that Google AMP is actually a very scary thing because it removes branding, it, um, it presents the news as Google's news. Um, and I think that that is true. I actually think it's scarier in a bigger way because um, Google AMP got a lot of people on board by saying that they want to speed up mobile web pages, they want to remove JavaScript from it, they want to remove carousels, pop-ups, adverts, analytics. They just want to be able to take your content and give it to people really quickly. And a lot of the big publishers, the, their news organizations, because that's a dead industry as well and they're slowly starting to realize it, they all jumped at that chance last, last year. And in the last year, Google said, we still believe all those things, but we've added back in analytics, but we're not going to give it to you. We've added in carousel. We've added everything must run on JavaScript. There will be adverts. There will be pop-ups, but they'll be controlled by us because that's what's really fantastic about it. And, and there's a lot, there, and you know, Guardian, which was a client of mine for a little while, is a great example of a, a fantastic company that's trying to do the right things. Um, and they're kind of locked into Google App now. They can't pull themselves out. They get so much of their traffic from it. And they're not going to be alone. So it's, it's a very scary thing. It, it's a, a new version of a monopoly. But that's because Google as well are clambering for something brand new. Because they, they, they were late to the party with OK Google. They've, they've lost huge market share to Alexa. Huge market share to Alexa. And by the way, Alexa is, 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 is a, in a positive way, a Trojan horse. This year, in my opinion, but certainly at the start of the next year, there will be an Alexa Echo thing in your house with a screen on it. Because it's not just going to be voice. It's not going to be, okay, Ale uh, Alexa, play me the latest song from Justin Bieber. It's going to be, okay, Alexa, can you show me the YouTube video for cutting this onion? <coughs> okay, Alexa, Gran is choking. How do I do the Heimlich maneuver? And that's how they're going to get in your house. They're not going to get in your house by telling you, we'll give you money off Amazon or it'll help with your Google. They will show you TV adverts that will show you that Alexa and OK Google and Siri, whenever Apple bring out theirs, is going to save your family life. And it's going to help their kids with the homework and all the rest of it. The Trojan horse is already in your home and Google were late to the party. And they're panicking. Last question? <laughs> yeah, I get that. Okay, guys. So um, that was the last question. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me for this.